Thank you all of you. Thank you very much for being here today for another lecture under the scope of the College for Global Studies at the Center for Social Studies, Coimbra University. And especially thank you, David, very much for having accepted to deliver the lecture today. And David is currently in California, so we have a long time difference, which explains why uh, is in the morning and we are late in the afternoon. The College of Global Studies, <clears throat> is, which is organized around the key lecture, aims to be a forum to critically address the processes of globalization, identifying crucial problems of the contemporary world as a starting point for a broader exchange of ideas in a provocative and constructive way. Today, the lecture will be delivered by Professor David Goldberg, and it will be followed as usual by a dialogue with the audience present via Zoom. Please write your questions and we'll convey them if they are written in Portuguese to Professor Goldberg. And let me remind you that tomorrow we'll have a second moment. Uh, initially, a uh, 40 minutes conversation between David, Bruno Sena Martins and Irina Bellico, the last two are our colleagues from SER, to be followed by a workshop with short talks, sharp presentations from guest researchers. It will be again at 5 p.m. Portuguese time. For us at SER, and on behalf of the College of Global Studies of Tiago and Irina and myself, it's a great honor to have David Theo Goldberg back today, as he is quite familiar to many of us here at SESH. I think if I'm not wrong, this would have been his third visit over the last 10, 15 years to SESH. So let's say the visit is just postponed. David currently is the director of the University of California's Humanities Research Institute, which is a system-wide research facility for human sciences and theoretical research in the arts. Without a comparative possibility, because his research institution is much broader than SES, but in a sense, in terms of objectives, we share quite a lot of common interests, this social science and humanities thinking together. David holds many faculty appointments from various academic areas, including comparative literature, anthropology, criminology, law and society, critical theory. A native of South Africa, is also very sensitive to North-South divisions and paths to overstep it. The Institute he coordinates has shown over the years that the Global South affords adventures insights into the workings of the world of the world at large, both through research, teaching, and global thinking. And it's very important. David is also well known for his innovative and fundamental research in critical race theory and the digital humanities. David's writings is well known. Let me just refer to you some of his latest books, including Are We All Post-Racial Yet? from 2017, Sites of Race from 2014, or the future of learning institutions in a digital age from 2000 and 2009, which is a sort of a premonitory alert regarding our contemporary condition, among other topics. Personally, uh, it was very impacting to me to read his conversation with Ashim Bembe entitled The Reason of the Reason, uh, a very rich piece to think the world today, from the idea of power and control to the import importance of that power in face of solid resistance, from enslavement and colonialism to empowerment, from the humanization to the recognition of humanity. Today will be again be given food for thought regarding the impact of the growing presence of algorithms in our lives. It's a privilege to have here today, David Goldberg to talk about tracking capitalism, the political economy of algorithmic culture, and to engage in a conversation about its driving themes and provocation. Thank you, David, very much for doing this lecture. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maria Paula. It's a pleasure to be here to you, your colleagues, Tiago, and others who have made this possible to share in um, the College of Global Studies. Really terrific to be back in a manner of speaking. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this in person uh, at, at future times. Obrigado. Um, I want to um, uh, talk about tracking capitalism, the hyphen is imperative uh, over here. So it's uh, not 
uh, a tracking of capitalism, but a capitalism that tracks. Uh, and I want to put it in the context of the historical formation uh, uh, of recent capitalism. So I'll start there. This is part of a larger book project. The book will be um, published in July from Polity uh, on Dread, uh, face, Facing Futureless Futures. I'm going to talk less about Dread today than on tracking capitalism uh, as what I call its operating, the, the political economy, the operating system, um, sort of underlying and giving rise to this condition of what I call dread. Um, so let me start with some comments about uh, uh, neoliberalism as a background out of which I will argue tracking capitalism uh, has develop developed. I mean, this will be a very quick thumbnail sketch. Uh, you're all familiar with the sort of conditions um, that neoliberalism uh, has, has amounted to. Um, I don't have control of the screen, so I'd like to forward, um, if I can forward slides, uh, just uh, talking about the way in which neoliberalization um, uh, is made up of a set of driving conditions. I mean, first, of course, is the well-known financialization of everything. If you look at these uh, two graphs uh, on your left-hand side, you will see the way in which financialization across the last 170 years, is, or 60 years up to uh, uh, 2009, uh, you'll notice that in uh, the 1930s, it went, uh, well, 1920s, it went up dramatically and then fell until after the Second World War. And then financialization has crept up and then obviously ballooned uh, in the last uh, 40 years. So for, the way in which uh, all aspects of life uh, are commodified and turned into um, being able to put a financial uh, number on it. And then on the right hand side is the way in which credit, uh, again, from, from the 1990s onwards, um, uh, the increase in debt has manifested rather dramatically uh, in, in relation to household uh, income. Uh, the, um, uh, on, on the left-hand side is the US, on the right-hand side uh, is uh, debt uh, in the case of the UK. Uh, but of course, you can uh, generalize this across all kinds of considerations. So first, financialization. Second, of course, deregulation deregulation. Uh, this uh, started dramatically in the 1980s, Reagan, Thatcher, Cole, and so on, uh, with the undoing of government regulations in order to um, uh, assess and control um, excesses in relation to corporate uh, activity. Uh, this, the middle image is uh, from the Texas deep freeze uh, a month ago. There's a very interesting story about the way in which Texas deregulated its uh, electric grid, all but the city of um, El Paso um, became privatized. El Paso remained connected to the national grid in the US. And so it didn't have the kind of deep freeze trouble that the rest of Texas had, uh, which led to the kind of um, isification that you're uh, seeing in, in, in this image. But what happened with deregulation was that people could choose whether they wanted to pay uh, user rates. So very, very low rates when they used little uh, electricity and people were fine with that. Texas is a warm place. I uh, wasn't using much electricity in the winter. And then in the week or 10 days of the deep freeze, of course, demand went dramatically up. And so prices went up and people were getting $17,000 electrical bills for that use in that 10 days and obviously didn't have the kind of uh, savings set aside to cover that. So you can see the way in which, the, you know, that's an extreme case, of course, the way in which deregula uh, deregulation manifests in, in all uh, kinds of ways. And then alongside of that is the self-proclaimed um, undertaking on the part of neoliberalization to disrupt everything, right? And you can see from uh, the set of corporate interests that are represented here. I mean, the, the most uh, is a way in which disruption is an undertaking in order to address problems without considering how 
that address of the problems might itself give rise to new forms of problem, but to create a new landscape of corporate activity, you see this out of a whole range. You could add Tesla to this grant, uh, to this graph, uh, for example. But you you can see the way in which, for example, the users of uh, Pinterest on your far left uh, are overwhelmingly women rather than men. The way in which uh, that kind of activity, um, you know, presumptively is disrupted uh, in various sorts of ways. Um, and this too was underpinned by uh, was a self-proclamation to diminish um, not just regulation, but state intervention in, in relation to a whole range of things. Grover Norquist uh, is a, an anti-tax ac activist in the US. Um, this famous quote, my goal is to cut government in half in 25 years to get it down to the size where we can drown it in the bathtub. This is of course, New Orleans during Ka Katrina where it was literally, literally drowned. Um, but the, uh, the undertaking is not so much to get rid of government completely, but to shift away from what I will characterize in a minute as the caretaking functions, the welfare functions of the state, and towards the securitization functions um, of the state. And you can actually track this across all kinds of societies um, in terms of, I mean, dif differently in different societies at different rates. But the way in which um, the repressive state apparatuses uh, had dramatically increased budgets, policing, uh, border patrol, uh, militarization, and so on, at the cost of the welfare function uh, of, of, of state formation. You see this uh, in, in, in the set of um, uh, images that the welfare state is made up of. Uh, you know, uh, three broad components, financial services that include old age pensions and unemployment benefits, child support and the like, social services, education, um, medical health care, uh, and then non-cash benefits like medications and housing um, subsidies uh, and the like. There is such a thing called a nanny state index. You can look it up. It's run out of a, a center called Epicenter in Britain. Uh, and it indexes in the European Union, what well, was the European Union, um, uh, uh, those that are less free and those that are more free uh, in terms of the uh, use of tobacco, the allowance for the generalized use of tobacco, vaping, uh, drinking in Europe. So the least free where there are restrictions, where you can do those things and the most free where there are no restrictions or fewer restrictions. And um, those who are three, interestingly enough, are Finland, Lithuania, Estonia, the UK, Hungary, Ireland, and Latvia in a range of 28 states. Uh, Portugal is in about the middle at 14th uh, in, in 2019. Um, and Germany and Czech, or, or the Czech Republic are taken to be the freest. I mean, that, it's a very long index actually of, of these indications. And then um, what you get also uh, out of this is the kind of personalization, I, I'll come to this in a minute, personalization of responsibility, but that sense of neoliberalization restricting freedom where you can see you can't take pictures here, you can't walk your dog here, you can't, et cetera, et cetera. The insertion of the state into the um, way in which uh, individual uh, responsibility and personal um, um, uh, res responsible taking is encircled by uh, state regulation and so on. And you can see from uh, Dwight Eisenhower in the 50s to Macron today is sort of going after uh, the this, this sense of government restriction. Uh, of activity that comes with a uh, neoliberalization. And this of course also leads to the, um, the intense undertaking on the part of the neoliberal state to um, personalize responsibility uh, and to privatize the undertaking of everything, right? Um, so that one is responsible for how one gets uh, on in life, uh, particularly leading to what, um, Foucault called you know, the man of enterprise, enterprise man, the way in which one is um, um, uh, given responsibility or take responsibility for your own life, your own career, for what you wanna do, where you wanna go with yourself, uh, how you wanna uh, 
conduct your career and so on and so forth. And then the development of an ecosystem of you that surrounds that in terms of the kinds of corporate structures that emerge uh, in, in, in the wake of that turn. And that man of uh, enterprise, uh, so, uh, um, uh, enterprising man is to riff off um, the proliferation of endless opportunities, which comes with the mandate, the mandate incessantly to strive for oneself, uh, to make something more of oneself. Uh, so it becomes the, the man, uh, the gendered formation is important here, uh, the man of ceaseless self-making and self-fabrication. And this, of course, is underpinned by a kind of dehistoricization that the, con the historical conditions that have given rise to the state of uh, conditions today are uh, eclipsed or set aside or buried uh, in, in, in the way in which what one, you know, if you don't make something of yourself, it has nothing to do of where you started out from. It's uh, a function of the fact that you haven't tried hard enough. I mean, Fukuyama puts us down to the end, the end of history as the end of ideology. Um, and that ideology is replaced by this sense of neoliberalizing neo conditions that are laid out here. Um, and this dehistoricization comes also with a, a shift in the understanding of time, um, really where uh, technology comes into play, that digital technology hastens or speeds up, speeds up time. Um, and so uh, algo temporality is about the immediation of time. I mean, you can see this as the flip side of dehistoricization, right? The way in which if time is in the immediate, in the now, uh, then of course the past, uh, even in terms of the, uh, uh, the way in which uh, the, the past is turned into data uh, and the data is only recalled in the immediate. Uh, in, in, in order to immediate uh, fight time. Uh, and this leads to, and here I'll get into the heart of the talk, uh, the emergence of techno power. It's, uh, you know, it's no mistake that um, uh, the, the, the diffusion of technology, it's not that technology wasn't there prior, but the emergence of digital technology uh, and its immersion into every aspect of life really does start uh, ramping up in the 1980s and takes hold with the development of the web uh, and email and so on uh, at the beginning of the 1990s. Notice in this image um, a thematic which I want to come back to repeatedly, and that is a way in which the figure of techno power is anthropomorphized, that the, the robotic always is in the figure of a semi human being, right? And we'll see the collapse of this relation between technology and the human uh, coming into, into play over here. So uh, let me just um, put this in a quick broader context of the development of, of capitalism. I mean, we start out with commodity capitalism. So for conventional commodity capitalism, value is principally extracted and profit produced or materialized at the point of consumption. It's not that uh, value is not created prior to this, but it's materialized at the point of consumption. You can see the way in which technology in this image um, releases the need for more and more workers. And I'll come back to this theme in a moment. The moment at which goods and services are purchased, I mean, that is the point of, of consumption, right? Value changes hands, not created, but changes hands, materially or increasingly virtually with payment. Uh, and out of this, gets extended uh, what I call event or experiential capitalism, a kind of larger than life form of capitalism. I mean, um, as service capitalism expands into what I call experiential capitalism, the production of value is radically extended into and throughout the experience. So cruise ships, fun parks, I mean, the larger than life cruise ship that overwhelms the cathedral in Venice gaming, sports spectatorship, concerts, festivals, fairs, spectacles in the everyday, church services, mega church services, fancy restaurants, expensive wines, et cetera, et cetera. 
And the experience itself is stretched out to maximize profit making by endless sharing in and after the moment. This includes experience related merchandise, photos, recordings, reviews, newsletters, consulting, advice, gig offerings, even nostalgia inducing social media anniversary reminders. The experiential became neoliberal capitalism's extended logic. I mean, the way in which commodification could be extended across a whole range of other activities other than the narrow focus on the commodity itself. Commodities that were advertised and sold through experiential qualities that were made to represent and promise, including value added servicing agreements and warranties. When you bought a motor car or you bought a washing machine, you weren't only buying that product, you were also buying the extended warranty in order to be able to take care of it over time. It is neither happenstance nor inconsequential that the experiential and its make-believe culture assume the public face of neoliberal capitalism. This was coterminous with the exorbitant, but far less evident, even gray rise of speculative finance, a kind of backroom sort of undertaking, privatizing individualism, more or less anonymous virtuality and boring, boring back-end digi digitization. So the experiential came to be the loudspeaker, you could say, of otherwise far less visible and celebrated success. One went to a restaurant and ordered, if one was a financier in uh, the center of London, and ordered a thousand dollar bottle of champagne in order to show how successful you'd been in that back end. COVID-19, the pandemic, not so much momentarily ended as upended the conditions of possibility for experiential capitalism. I mean, the very, uh, outbreaks in Europe and the United States, for example, were exactly on cruise ships and in mega church services. I mean, South Korea, for example, uh, right? The first outbreak was, was in, a, in a mega church service. It did so both by exhibiting their deadly impacts and by curtailing the broad range of experiential possibility. Um, cruises and large uh, church services, as I say, became ground zero for the viral spread. The, the lockdown requirements delimited the conditions or possibility for robust consumptive experiences. So the experiential both reveals and conceals. Value reveals itself in the experience. Focus on the experiential conceals the circuits of capital, production and delivery of the means to enable the experience. To take one example, consider the route that ex exotic foods takes from the place that it right, is discovered and then brought to the restaurant table in Europe or the United States or the global north, right, um, and the, um, the lack of immunity to the pathogenic um, illnesses those exotic foods uh, are, uh, may unleash and find its way, um, right, one then has to get the drug to treat it, which finds its way from a Chinese lab and factory where it is likely produced into my possession. Those circuits um, of um, delivery are completely um, um, invisible to the, uh, at the point of consumption, right? They're hidden from view. And so out of this emerges the shift into what I call techno-capitalism, right? You see this uh, again in shorthand, uh, it, most visibly uh, in the Uberization effect, right? Which is of course, uh, the fact that corporations take themselves to have fewer and fewer employees that they have to take care of, the lack of uh, medical care or medical insurance or benefits, uh, the de-waging uh, that take, takes place as a consequence of all of this, uh, the privatization of responsibility where you have to pay even for your own uh, um, means in order to be able to produce and reproduce yourself. Uh, so in Uber's case, the motor car, right, you're responsible for it, they don't cover uh, the wear and tear in the car and so on and so forth. On the one hand, and then in financial markets on the other, and again, you see this anthropomorphizing of the robot, which is driving the uh, massive acceleration uh, of uh, investment in the market. Already more than half a decade in the making, techno-capitalism began to suffuse in the takeover. You see this in notions like platform capitalism, algorithmic capitalism and the like. 
these then not so much practices as instruments, the infrastructures of the newly elaborating capitalism. In the age of surveillance capitalism, Shoshana Zuboff, that book, traces the developments of the history of capitalist form. She starts really the late 19th century. You could go back earlier behind that to mercantile capitalism and so on. But she says, capitalism has scaled from the production line through mass production to sequenced waves of managerialism, service, and then financial capital. The latest and most dramatically profitable form she identifies is more intrusive by far than any previous mode. Online user data, which of course data surplus, are collected on a massive scale through the ubiquitous embedding of cookies in browsers, as well as sensors and monitors in the general landscape. They generate together personal user navigated um, uh, activity profiles on the basis of which su subjects will be targeted commercially, economically, politically, you could say even criminologically, right? So this massive collection of data becomes a driving force uh, of data surplus, which then drives profitability in contemporary capital. No internet user, generally no one connected to or navigating any grid, digital or infrastructural is immune. I mean, the fact that we're online over here uh, uh, speaks to this. Personal user and activity data are declared the private propriety products of the corporations collecting them. You don't own your data, the corporations Google, et cetera, et cetera, <clears throat> are taken to, <clears throat> excuse me, are taken to be the owners of them. Users see the data on the basis of user agreements, largely illegible and incomprehensible to all but the lawyers and maybe not even them composing uh, these user agreements. Users are merely one click away from disowning the user data and disinheriting, ceding to some anonymous corporate entity their user <clears throat> they use pro profiles. So Zuboff calls this surveillance capitalism. Right, surveillance capitalism is a surveillance from the top down, right? It's a kind of oversight of, of, of everything that is going on underneath its, its gaze, right? I remember visiting, I don't know, the, the Tel Aviv airport about 20 years ago and marveling at the fact that was that every move you were making within that airport structure was overseen by hidden people and hidden cameras. Uh, that's what she means by the way in which this transformed into surveillance capitalism. It is a capitalism that pries into and logs every porous activity of contemporary lives. Data are generated through the web browsers used through mobile phone and tablet usage um, and location, consumption and navigation online and off. Surveillance is meant to capture the technological intrusiveness where nothing is off limits to data harvesting. But contemporary capitalism, the profiles it creates are more concerned with patterns of navigation than content of consumption. So I'm shifting into a, an argument that breaks a bit with Zuboff here. This is not to say that surveillance and content concern are irrelevant, of course not. Rather, the emphasis has shifted. The title of a book, when it's caught up on Amazon, is of more immediate focus. It's metadata more readily inscribed than the contents between the covers. Tag terms are more directly generative for harvesting than political or philosophical argument a publication might be making. On, on, on this count, thus capital is equal to the wealth of nations, so long as it's generating the same number of cells or leading to cells of other titles alongside of it uh, at the likes of Amazon and so, um, or, lead, um, or embeds a kind of security threat, right? So it may be more accurate to term this not surveillance capitalism. I'm going to contrast it with what I call tracking, hyphenated tracking capitalism, a capitalism that tracks pretty much everything. So what to make of this tracking capitalism? The operating system for which is predicated on tracking everyone uh, and everything. So here you see the way in which digitally managed profiles are created by the feeding of all this data into <coughs> singular uh, platforms. And this really started the shift to this. I mean, the shift started, as Zuboff says in, in roughly 2001, 
when Google moved from a search platform to an advertising platform, but it really ramped up in 2014. Uh, Jay-Z, the rapper, played a gig in Toronto. Uh, uh, a, by geo-tracking their smartphones, a marketing and analytics company was able to determine that roughly 13,000 fans attended uh, the concert, but they were more concerned not just with the numbers of attendance, but really with what the people were doing before leading up to the, immediately before leading up to the concert, where they went afterwards and what they were consuming. So there was a significant shift taking place from about 2010 onwards that this 2014 concert kind of manifested. Digital technology has dramatically transformed our world. <clears throat> Work, play, learning, education, politics, recreation are all conducted differently in the wake of its development and almost universal adoption. We communicate, interact, consume, exercise, mind our health, bank, invest, travel, not just with greater speed, but in significantly contrasting ways to the way we used to, at least those of us old enough to have uh, been there beforehand. <laughs> Even writing, reading, and cultural production, of course, are more generally um, have altered as a consequence. Personal computing and mobile, device, uh, and mobile devices are within arm's reach through waking and even sleeping hours. Life, you could say, no longer turns off. As the Jay-Z event signaled, all this was upending social, economic, political, and cultural life in completely unanticipated ways. The large scale changes of this past decade have had less visible but equally telling implications for work profiles and positions, for who gets hired, for what functionality, as well as in assessing job performance. I'll give you some examples in due course. The digital has taken its disruptability as a definitive operating condition of its widespread application. It disrupts longstanding and taken for granted modes of production, work structures and practices. Uh, so conceptions like born digital and digital native reveal a contrasting time and culture before and after you know, B, A, D, B, D, and A, D become the before digital and, and after digital in, in this temporality. And what this also led to was a dramatic uh, shift in the way in which jobs are conducted and who or what populates these jobs. The, there's been wide um, projection of automation and job loss, um, a very wide range of prediction, depending on the study that you look at, between 30 and 60% over the next quarter century, um, uh, by say 2035, even 15 years uh, of, of job loss of personal jobs to robotification. A McKinsey report says that 30% of US jobs will be lost in the next decade or so. Uh, a more a uh, conservative report from Oxford Economics says that 10% of manufacturing jobs will be automated in the next decade. China is leading the way over here rather dramatically. So 12 million jobs in China in the next decade will be robotified. In the US, 1.5 million. In the EU, 2 million jobs. In South Korea, which only has a population of 20 million, um, 800,000 jobs um, are projected to, to be lost in all of this. So in the past five years, robots have become less expensive, now undercutting the manufacturing costs of human labor. Microchips process more powerfully, batteries have longer lifespans, and network operating systems have become significantly what gets characterized as smarter. Production line breakdowns are, are easier to track and fix. Output has become faster, costs have reduced. These trends are translating into automation developments beyond manufacturing, from warehouse distribution to service and some office tasks, even journalism articles are being written by um, automation and so on. The rate and range of job losses are bound, of course, to increase too. Amazon's warehouses deploy small robots to package goods for shipping. They take a quarter or less of the time human packers require, and again, you see the, you know, to make this more familiar to us or more um, ourselves more open to this, the robots are being anthropomorphized as well. They, they're made to look like humans, 
uh, as though we couldn't tell the difference. So they've been designed to do the heavy lifting and repetitive functions in manufacturing and commerce more generally. They function faster, operating uh, without, in, um, without incurring injuries. When they break down, which is not the same as an injury, they can be replaced by the next in line without work compensation cost. Of course, they're ramping up costs for the robot. As they grow smarter, they'll be able to take on more and more road functions in offices too, filing, perhaps basic bookkeeping, composition, completely completing standardized regulatory forms, sending and tracking form correspondence, et cetera, et cetera. In manufacturing, those most likely to be impacted by the job loss, at least for the few foreseeable future, uh, are the less well off. And these have tend to be racially um, characterized kinds of um, um, job inhabitants. Blacks pretty much everywhere, Latinos in the US are significantly more white are more likely than whites and Asians to occupy uh, these positions affected by robotification. This is baked into the history, of course, of racial capitalism. And I should just add that the forms of racial capitalism have transformed along with the transformation in the forms of capitalism itself. So it would be interesting to track in our um, analysis of racial capitalism, how uh, the forms of labor racially inscribed have transformed um, over time. There is a long history of identifying technological innovation and development with whites, as well, of course, as their benefits. Digital technology is little different, especially if you include those historically designated only whites or model minorities, uh, most notably Asians. The top lines of work to be impacted by automation include manufacturing production, office and administrative support, farming, fishing and forestry, transportation and moving. Those least likely range over the de uh, domains requiring more agile reasoning. So the argument goes a nuanced intricate judgment, including business and financial operations. I mean, you can see the racial inscription of work, education and training, um, as well as architecture and engineering. Workers with lower levels of education will be far more readily impacted than those with graduate education. Uh, automation clearly will exacerbate rather than narrow existing economic and by extension political and social and racial inequalities. I mean, it's interesting um, that it turns out that robotification is having unexpected impact on how work is done by human beings as well. Ro robots operate much faster, as I mentioned, um, involving rote manual, but also increasingly cognitive functionality. This is being used to pressure human beings in the change of production and delivery. You see this at Amazon, for example, where more injuries on the part of human beings are being incurred, trying to keep up with robots delivering in this production line um, uh, over here. Um, interestingly enough, there's a development, a very recent development in what is called the digital employee, you can go and hire a robot today. I mean, right now you can go and click and hire a robot to serve as your personal um, office assistant. Uh, uh, Chetan Dube, the CEO of IT Soft has created Amelia. Again, look at the profile. This is a robot, right? Um, I mean, uh, again, look at the gendered and, and racial profile of, of this. Um, what he calls a digital employee, a, or a cognitive agent and virtual assistant. Um, you hire this robot, put them into the workspace, and within 10 minutes of watching others do the work they do, this robot, so the argument goes, has picked up the functionality of those people. So literally human beings are being used to train robots in real time in order to replace right, the trainers. Uh, by the robotified uh, anthropomorphized image uh, at work over here. Studies of turnaround and delivery commitments at Amazon, as I said, reveal that company management requires more quickened work rates for human workers in the production chain uh, so that robots are able, so that the robots are able to function more efficiently. It's not that the robots have to be efficient right in order to service the human workers. It's the flip now, uh, kind of interestingly. Similarly, uh, employers are using uh, apps on wearables 
like Fitbit and Apple Watch to track employee performance. The app monitors non-work related time away from employer's desk or office, time on the phone, quality of sleep at night, so it's 24 seven, right? uh, all of which demonstrably impact quality uh, of work. Automation is reinforcing the inclination among corporate uh, leaders pressured by shareholders and venture funders to robotify human functionality. So you can see the way in which these um, forces are sort of coming together. As the robotic is made to look and act like the human, human workers are increasingly being robotified. The steady decline of manufacturing positions in industrialized economy as a global economy, economy has become deeply integrated and workplaces increasingly automated has resulted in concerns about social disruption more broadly. I mean, you know, just to go back to Amelia, that figure, um, once again, you can see the way in which there's a kind of re-racial um, um, characterization of the workforce, right? In the way in which robots are being turned uh, into, um, you know, historically dominant um, uh, worker characterizations in, 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 in the workplace. Where once reliable work could be counted on for career long employment, especially by the white male working class, employment opportunities uh, today might just evaporate tomorrow. In the US, it's estimated that a person change, changes their job every four years and changes their profession every 10 years. So they shift from one profession to another roughly every decade. So it's speeding up. Um, and so the way in which people are being trained and replaced become kind of part of the debate about what education amounts to. This perhaps signals less that work is disappearing than that it's changing in nature. Service work is increasingly replacing manufacturing work. The shift away from mall shopping to online consumption means that entry level positions for you know, 18 or 19 year olds as they finish high school and go into the workforce and not say into higher education uh, means that those jobs are no longer so readily available. So they're becoming packers or uh, packers assistants in Amazon warehouses under these kinds of uh, conditions and, and uh, so on. The gig or on demand economy is offering a wide range of work, more flexible, if far less secure in terms of benefits and healthcare provision uh, in the face of the likes of COVID insecurity. So the digital revolution, of, of course, has produced a good deal that is productive and beneficial. We wouldn't be talking to each other now like this, if not for this uh, di digital development. But it's, the technology has also made personal and private lives more available to observation and intrusion by those to whom we otherwise bear no relation. The hardware of all contemporary smartphones and mobile devices enables active monitoring of data generated from their use and location. Google's Android is much more uh, insertive uh, than Apple's iPhone, for example. So you're being watched and listened to all the time. I mean, the Android uh, uh, phones are able to integrate the uploaded data they generated in an archive with the users, Gmail, Google search activity, and Google Docs. Um, uh, Google Assist enables recordings of conversations occurring within earshot of its microphone uh, adding these to the database too. So there's a constant stream of data more often than not made available for purchase by then third parties. That's why you're getting this stream all the time of requests to buy this, do that, uh, and so on and so on. So for everyone is much more an open book than we may be comfortable with where we to know about it. Maybe now you know about it. And this also leads to a new legal regime uh, of di digital rights management. So for example, when you used to buy a real, or still do buy a real copy of a physical book, you own the book, you own that copy, right? You can do with it what you will. You can read it, you can share it, you can lend it out, you can give it away. Unfortunately, some people burn it and so on and so forth. It's yours to do with what you will. The digital copy, on Kindle or Amazon and so on that you purchase, right? If you look at the user agreements, that belongs to you only for a determined amount of time, a year, five years, whatever it is. 
um, at which point that ownership ends and reverts back to the corporation, right? They can, and, and you can't share it. You, you know, it's only uh, one IP address that it can go to uh, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are um, struggles against it, readers against digital rights management, for example. Um, but this is the way in which the legal regime is transforming under our nose. Algorithms, of course, provide the operating logic for the software running all these digital devices, producing patterns of the way in which we connect with each other and operate uh, in the world. The pro this process makes actual what Zuboff calls accurating the personality each person is projected to embody, at least digitally, by encouraging, if not expecting them to, to produce the preference schemes it, pre it presents to them. So surveillance, she, as I said, she, she characterizes as a generic term for attending closely to persons, monitoring their moves and thoughts. Technologically enhanced surveillance is about a century old, wiretapping developed in the 1930s, uh, taking hold, targeting suspected criminals as well as labor and political activists. Tracking has come more recently to provide the precise means in the way I've been um, uh, spelling out here, the technologies for this micro monitoring. A considerable network of digital piracy sites and practices has emerged, devoted in the name of a global commons to making freely available pretty much any publication or media product, copyright be damned. So there's a, there's a counter movement to uh, all of this that one needs to acknowledge. The corporations holding ownership rights seem less concerned about protecting the contents of the products, as I say, than perhaps relatedly about tracking and restricting access to uh, sustain demand and therefore profitability. Um, I mentioned Jay-Z, the, the tracking at the concert, but Tsinghua University, for example, in Beijing, um, the police track the way in which everybody operates. I mean, this is generically Chinese now. Um, Right, they, they track you through your, through your phone, which you're carrying around you all the time and expected to have on. So if, you, if you're driving a car on the Tsinghua campus and you're say driving 33 kilometers an hour in a 25 kilometer an hour um, drive zone, you'll get an in-time text message with a photograph of your car and license plate as you're driving, telling you you are speeding to slow down. And if you don't slow down, you will be fine. Or if you, uh, you know, if you do this repeatedly across time, you'll be fine, um, and uh, the condition will be added to your social credit score, right? Um, so they're less concerned about the particular instance than about the um, the profile of instances that then get attached to your characterization, to your personal profile um, over time. Um, Across many African countries, South Africa most notably, individuated biometric profiles have been developed for many residents, linking fingerprints to work, banking, loans, pattern consumption, and other sources of personal data. And Keith Breckenridge has done a lot of work uh, on this across Africa. It's happening in India as well. He calls this biometric capitalism. Um, more intrusively, uh, sensors are being embedded sometimes forced in the Chinese case, sometimes uh, by choice into people's forearms, right? Um, uh, and you can then load up the, um, the, the file um, with, um, um, uh, with, dig with digital credit, right? So a kind of credit card kind of mapped into your arm, uh, you know, cryptocurrency of one kind or another that you can then go and use when you go shopping and actually just use your hand, not have to pull out a wallet uh, and it will be uh, credited to, you, to your hand effectively or to open to get access, security access into a secure building, which is now being widely used um, in China. Um, more intrusively, some Chinese factories are embedding technology in the production line workers, measuring their brainwave activity to determine fluctuations in emotion fatigue, productivity over, over the work day. So nothing's off limits. A school in uh, Hangzhou in China 
recently installed classroom cameras recording images of students' facial expressions every 30 seconds. The images are sorted according to expression type, neutral, angry, upset, happy, sad, surprised. You could see brain insertions in the future doing this. Uh, the assessment serves not just to enable the teachers in time adjustment to maximize teaching success, but to keep a kind of disciplinized uh, minute by minute teacher assessment, associating student emotional responses to teacher effectiveness, student attentiveness and potential success. Um, one shouldn't think that this is only happening uh, in China in, in a variety of ways. Uh, it's happening in uh, societies like uh, the United States. I'm in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip some things. Um, uh, so that, uh, for example, in the US, uh, some insurance companies are insisting on putting sensors in the home in order to get a reduced uh, insurance, home insurance rate to ensure that one is not smoking as one claims one is not in the home or other un undertaking other hazardous activities. So you can see the way in which data is being projected at every twist and turn over here. Um, early digital tools were promoted in the interest of reinforcing the democratic impact. Social media enabled crowdsourcing, flash mobbing, and sophisticated encryption technologies like blockchain have served populist democratic initiatives, sometimes with enormous impact. Yet it has turned out to be no glitch in the system that authoritarianism is back uh, in vogue with a vengeance. Right, you can see the way in which uh, here are really privacy laws. I mean, this is a quite fascinating image. So in the United States, which is green, laws applied, pr privacy laws, the use of data, uh, right, apply overwhelmingly not in the private corporate sphere, but in the public sphere. In China, it's the flip, right? Uh, the, the state can use your data whatever way it wants. Corporations are restricted to using your data uh, in various ways. So you can see the way in which all this plays out um, uh, in, in, in various conditions. It is being embedded by those with overriding means and inclination as a feature of the operating system. It's masquerading as openness and transparency. It's not a bug. It's a viral condition and not an anomaly. Huawei has ratcheted up tracking, uh, tracking's operating system driven by the direction of China's state authoritarianism and drawing on the resources of state capitalism. Data, you could say, are the new raw materials. Data harve harvesting uh, the tool set. Um, Harari, um, uh, you've all know Harari causes digital dictatorship. The capacity of the digital to, di to dictate what to do in matters of life and death as, a, uh, as supplemented by data sovereignty. Tracking capitalism then mobilizes and applies algorithmically driven technology to track the movements, virtual and physical, of almost everyone and everything nearly everywhere. Real-time data are incessantly updated and related to the vast existing database to project movements, acts, desires, interests, commitments, possible acts, and their probability. The pressure to track has been dramatically heightened, of course, by the pandemic. Think of tracking and tracing as a condition. So it should come as no surprise that the large tech companies, those exactly that have been instrumental in institutionalizing the sociality of tracking, have also been so pan pandemically profitable. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, one can go on in, the, in this kind of, uh, let me sort of fast forward uh, a little bit. So uh, to contrast surveillance and tracking over here, surveillance proceeds by monitoring the content people are communicating. Tracking by extension plots movements and networks. Surveillance reads off threat, danger, performance from the content of communication and interaction. Tracking reads off from people's activity from their metadata likely future behavior via um, prediction algorithms from relational data about movement, networks, lines, rather than content of communication. The data in that sense supposedly dictate. Surveillance thus requires tracking. Tracking presupposedly does not necessitate 
surveillance. Tracking seeks to evade the charge of privacy violations, that surveillance perennially suffers by insisting it is content neutral. So, you know, obviously surveillance goes in and looks at everything you're doing, violating privacy, tracking claims that it's not looking at the content, it's just looking at the networks of relation and interaction that is taking place. So tracking updates surveillance. The virtuality renders tracking technology less visible, more anonymous, perversely less deeply intrusive, while more pervasive and stealthy than surveillance. Tracking generalizes, you could say, drone logic. It is the eye in our everyday technology seeing everything, faint enough to overlook while perpetually in play, posing as your friendly enabler to advance your interests. You all get accepting our, co our cookies make us work better for you, right? I mean, that's, that's tracking at work, right? Tracking, in fact, is a declaration uh, of, of war on all. Uh, there's a case, right, even when people are traveling, right, uh, you are being tracked. I mean, so A.L. Weitzman, the forensic architecture uh, person who's a good friend, was refused entry into the United States because he'd been, I think it was to Yemen, and he was asked who he interacted with when he applied for a visa. And when he refused to name names, they wouldn't let him in. So you can see the way in which tracking is tracking um, every movement over uh, here. Webcams are brought into or attached to user devices are capable of watching and recording what their users do, as I say, even unbeknownst um, to them. So Zuboff calls all of this instrumentarianism. And I want to give a different, uh, I mean, to the surveillance condition, the way in which information uh, is drawn together. Um, and what I, what I uh, prefer to call this is a kind of technopticon, obviously playing on panopticon, that uh, you know, the panopticon was, again, surveillance from above. Uh, and then uh, internalized within each person thinking that they might be watched so they better not uh, do anything, even if they weren't. Uh, the technopticon is actually tracking everything. Uh, and then that gets internalized into subjectivity and, uh, and, and, and the results um, sort of uh, get fashioned. You can see the authoritarianism at work in the very notion of, of hive mind. I mean, Hive mind is generative. Development of Wikipedia is a version of Hive mind. Hey, Hive mind, can you help me with this or that information? But the Hive, right, in uh, social insects and so on, are very hierarchically ordered and distributed so that if one steps out of line in relation to the hierarchical order of the Hive, one is excommunicated, literally um, to one's death right, um, uh, from the hive, and you get something of the same thing uh, at, at, at work uh, in this development of kind of info power into this technop technoptical uh, form of power at work, so that everything, one's, um, one's iris scans, one's face scans, uh, and so on, there's been a big debate about uh, the fact that darker skinned people and women with cosmetics are less easily able to be uh, facially recognized, which of course, when you're trying to open your phone uh, has consequences, but you know, there might be an upside to not being facially recognized over here that I think one needs to take seriously um, uh, as well. So there's a, there's a kind of double uh, edge uh, uh, to all of this. Um, so you see from all of this, uh, the development, uh, as I said, of insurance companies uh, using this technology, but also increasing the incarceration. Uh, so incarceration, is, you know, physical incarceration, putting people in prisons. I mean, as there's been um, an increasing focus on incarceration as the wrong way to go uh, in a society like the US, which has the largest per capita, uh, incarceration rates or among the highest in the world, you see the shift to what is called e-carceration, what uh, Michelle Alexander uh, has called e-carceration, e that is putting digital um, ankle devices uh, around one in order to watch, right, if one's 
violated the law in order to watch uh, what you're doing and where you're going and who you're interacting with and so on and so forth. So you can see the way in which the traditionally incarcerated populations will be targeted by these shifts uh, over time as Alexander um, uh, has, uh, has indicated. So that once again, uh, populations of color be, be, become the laboratories for uh, the extension of racial capitalism um, over, uh, over time. Uh, and this kind of technology is being used in universities as well to monitor attendance in classes so that uh, people are asked to um, <clears throat> know, uh, leave their phones on and come in and uh, uh, register their attendance uh, through, a, through a digital, digital device. Uh, to make sure that they're attending class uh, and not skipping class, uh, that they're showing up, uh, if they're living on campus, that they're showing up for meals. It's supposedly part of the caretaking function of the university. But again, everything is being mapped uh, uh, as, as a result uh, of all of this. Uh, and indeed, corporations are developing uh, tracking devices for your computer to make sure that, uh, that you're not shirking work uh, when you're supposed to be working, right? So increasingly, as one has worked from home during the pandemic, corporations have embedded tracking devices into your computer to make sure you're at your computer and not, you know, having a conversation with a friend or a lover or a parent uh, or, or, you know, at a coffee shop where you're not supposed to be and so on uh, and so forth. Um, uh, the dramatic expansion of homework uh, has developed a new app aptly called Sneak, S-N-E-E-K. Um, it photographs workers at their home desks every five minutes, ensuring that their pro profitability, uh, their sorry, their uh, productivity and by extension profitability is, is not lagging. Um, so to try to bring this to something of a uh, close. Uh, these factors in political economy prompt the spiral in contemporary anxiety, heightening a pervasive sense of uncertainty. Life-sustaining resources seem not to be readily available or to quickly evaporate. Unanticipated disasters, whether environmental or political, appear more dramatic and potentially deadly. One cannot know when next one might participate in taking for granted practices from social gatherings to travel and attending crowded events. Invisibly tracked interactions by government corporations or hackers materialize almost daily. We saw with COVID how unprepared we all, we all are for these predictably unpredictable eruptions and private personal information threatens to crystallize when least um, expected. So you can see the way in which, you know, Facebook, which has 2 billion users, becomes a way of both tracking and commodifying uh, tracking and then also transforming that tracking. I mean, think of Cambridge Analytica, right? Uh, into sort of political surveillance uh, and, and activity. Uh, you know, tracking one's digital footprint over time through these data information feeds so that one is not just being surveyed from outside, one is being internally tracked through one's every waking and sleeping hour uh, at this point in time. And so I'll end just by pointing out that this is ramping up, not just through the likes of epidemics, uh, pandemics like the one we've been witnessing, uh, but also uh, uh, is likely to be following us around through kind of environmental um, uh, uh, disasters uh, that, that are pending and so on, where the landscape is being tracked as much as human beings uh, active. Uh, in it, and I'll end there. Uh, next next ex exit might be no exit. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. <clears throat>